I'm your host, Nick Jacomis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Nicholas Glinos. Nick obtained his PhD in molecular and integrative physiology from the University of Michigan, where he is now a postdoctoral researcher. He is studying psychedelics. For his PhD work, he studied NN dimethyltryptamine, or DMT, which is one of the most powerful psychedelics out there in terms of the intensity of the hallucinations that it induces in human beings. It's also one of the shortest acting. It's very similar in structure to natural compounds in our brains like serotonin and melatonin. It is very similar to other psychedelics like psilocybin, but it's very different in various ways that make it very, very interesting. And Nick has studied both endogenous and exogenous DMT. He has studied DMT that's actually produced in the body, in the brain of rats. So they studied rodents. They looked at whether or not DMT could be measured in the brains of rats. They looked at how the levels of that endogenous DMT compared to other neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine. And they also looked at exogenous DMT, actually giving rats DMT and looking at what happened. How did IV DMT actually influence uh, levels of other neurotransmitters in the brain? Uh, what did the time course of DMT look like in the brain? What did the animal's behavior look like? And how did DMT actually affect global patterns of brain activity in rats as measured by things like EEG? So if you're interested in dimethyltryptamine and what it does, if you're interested in the story of DMT research uh, going back to the early 1900s and what we learned over time and what we just learned recently, Recently, in terms of whether this is truly an endogenous compound in the mammalian brain, this is a fascinating conversation. Uh, so we focused almost all of the conversation on DMT, but we also talked a little bit about some other psychedelics, uh, mostly in the context of the history of the field around DMT research. But most of it is about DMT in the brain, whether or not it's there, and what it might be doing. As always, don't forget I have a Substack, mindandmatter.substack.com. You can sign up for my free weekly newsletter. You can support the podcast further and become a paid subscriber if you enjoy what I'm producing. And you can check out all of my written and podcast content on that Substack. Check out the links in the episode description to get to that Substack or find out how you can support the podcast further. This episode is supported in part by Athletic Greens. Their main product, AG1, is a comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition product containing 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients with less than one gram of sugar per serving, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything. It's gluten and dairy free and compatible with paleo, vegan, vegetarian, and ketogenic diets. AG1 is a quick and convenient way to supplement your diet to help ensure your body is getting the nutrients it needs. It comes in powder form and you can Mix it in water and drink it, or you can put it into a smoothie or a shake or something like that. I mix it into water and drink it with the first meal of each day, and it's super convenient. If you go to athleticgreens.com slash mindandmatter, Athletic Greens will give you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Their vitamin D product comes in tincture form, so you just take one drop each day. A large fraction of the population is actually vitamin D deficient, especially in winter months when we get less sun exposure, and vitamin D is super important for the proper function of the immune system and for a variety of other things. And there's even evidence indicating that vitamin D deficiency is correlated with more severe cases of COVID-19 in those who get infected. Every time I go into the doctor each year for a checkup, I'm always told that vitamin D deficiency is very common and I should be supplementing on a daily basis. So visit athleticgreens.com slash mindedmatter or click the link in the episode description. You'll get a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. And with that, here's my conversation with Dr. Nicholas Glinos. Welcome, yeah, thanks for having me. Can you start off by just telling everyone a little bit about who you are and, and what kind of research you do? Mm. Yeah, so I finished a PhD in molecular and integrated physiology at University of Michigan last May, so almost a year ago now. And my PhD work was focused on DMT primarily. We looked at um, endogenous DMT and how it's regulated and um, different functions of endogenous DMT. And then we also explored some different aspects of exogenously administered DMT in a rodent model. Um, I also contributed a lot to uh, psychedelic education and activism at Michigan during my PhD and published some papers on um, naturalistic psychedelic use and looking at interactions with healthcare providers and changes in um, outcomes reported by people using psychedelics nat naturalistically. 
and currently I'm in a postdoctoral role also at the University of Michigan, and I'm in the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center. And there we have a group that's working on various psychedelic studies, and we're currently running a clinical trial with psilocybin treating uh, patients with fibromyalgia. Interesting. So, um, yeah, I read some of your work looking at DMT, endogenous DMT, and the effects of exo exogenous DMT in rodents, um, which was very interesting. Can I just want to give people a little bit of a background in terms of what DMT is and, and what was known about it before getting into your work? So, uh, can you give people like a cliff notes on like what is DMT chemically? How is it different from other psychedelics? Yeah, I, I think DMT is the most interesting psychedelic. Um, and that was my passion when I came into graduate school was to get involved in DMT research. Um, it's a it's a pretty simple molecule. It's structurally similar to uh, the neurotransmitter serotonin. It's also structurally similar to other psychedelics like uh, psilocybin. Um, and it's uh, it's a tryptamine. And that's the chemical class that it, that it belongs to. And it's... Uh, it's dime. It's got two methyl groups attached to the to the amino part of the tryptamine, making it dimethyltryptamine. Um, and it's got it's got an interesting history and actually a pretty long history in terms of uh, in terms of relative to other psychedelics. Um, it's an active comp component in the hallucinogenic brew ayahuasca, which has been used uh, across South America in various indigenous cultures for at least a thousand years. Um, and ayahuasca is a very important uh, ceremonial and medicinal brew that's been that's been consumed widely across across South America. Um, and DMT was brought into sort of uh, Western science in the early 1900s. It was discovered in 1931 by a chemist named Richard Mansky, um, and he discovered it. And it was kind of set aside before it was investigated any further. And it wasn't until I think it was 1955. Um, Stephen Sara, a chemist in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, was interested in um, reports of uh, ethnographers that were studying uh, plant-based hallucinogens in South America, and they were bringing plants back, and they were curious what the active compounds in the plants were that were causing these hallucinations and these uh, psychedelic-like experiences. And it was found that uh, DMT was a high uh, uh, a candidate for for that molecule to be the the psychoactive compound. So he uh, administered or began the first clinical trial or the first uh, Western science research trial with DMT, and he administered it intramuscularly first to himself and then to participants and found that it was uh, indeed hallucinogenic and psychedelic. Um, how how much did he also, inject himself with? <laughs> what's that? How much did he give himself? Uh, I don't remember the dose exactly, but, but I'm sure there was quite a bit of trial and error because I think... Uh, you know, obviously you would probably try an oral administration first. And I believe he did that and found that DMT mm. wasn't orally active um, and then had to go the intramuscular route to, to, to get the, to get the effects. Um, so that kind of uh, brought some interest into this molecule, into this compound uh, as a psychedelic compound. And this was also kind of occurring around the time when um, LSD was, was being investigated in a, in a research context and in a clinical context, and also around the time of the dis discovery of serotonin as a naturally occurring endogenous compound that has, has effects on mental states and mood and various other physiological and neurobiological functions. Um, so this, this idea of, uh, uh, I guess further on that is, uh, it was also soon discovered that DMT was a uh, naturally occurring endogenous compound. So it was, it was found in, first it was found in uh, rodents, and then it was found to be detected in, um, in human bodily fluids and cerebral spinal fluid and blood and plasma. And when we say, so when we say it was detected, it was found to be an endogenous compound. What exactly does that mean? Um, so I, I know that it means it's found in the body, but I want to make a distinction here between um, was it, did they figure out that it was produced in the body and doing something, serving a biological function, or was it detected at the body in very low levels and may just have been some kind of metabolic by byproduct? And, and how do we actually decide which one? Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. So I think the the latter is is the correct. So it was detected in um, 
in human bodily fluids, blood, urine, cerebral spinal fluid at, at very low levels, mm. which uh, are in, in, in current understanding, those levels are not recognized to be physiologically significant. So even today, after having known that DMT occurs in the body naturally, uh, we, we've known this for almost 75 years, we still don't know the function of DMT and it, and it very much could be like you said, a metabolic byproduct or, a, or an inactive metabolite. Um, but there's, uh, you know, still reason to investigate it for, for reasons that it, that it's a, it's, it's a naturally occurring compound and it likely does have some function. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it would and be when they surprising when they found it in, in animal tissues, did, did they find it at higher levels back in like the mid 20th century? Um, not so much, uh, not, not, there wasn't really any comparative studies to show that DMT was at, uh, found at levels comparable to other, um, you know, active metabolites or active neurotransmitters or signaling molecules. Most of the early work was actually done, uh, indirectly. So what they would do is, uh, try to, trying to discover or understand the biosynthetic pathway of DMT. And they mm -hmm. would do that by taking enzyme extracts or tissue extracts and incubating them with the precursor molecules like tryptamine, and then finding out whether that tryptamine can be methylated to form N-methyltryptamine and then dimethyltryptamine. And that's sort of an indirect measure of uh, determining whether uh, you know DMT could be active or could be present in the body, in, in, in the mammalian body. I see. So, so DMT is a tryptamine, which means it's probably ultimately produced from tryptophan in the body. It's similar chemically to serotonin. It's similar to other psychedelics like psilocybin and psilocin. Uh, it was, you know, it was discovered, you know, decades and decades ago. Now they they knew it was there. They could detect tiny amounts in cerebral spinal fluid in humans. They could detect small amounts in other animal tissues. At that time, it wasn't known if the DMT was produced in order to do something important in animal tissues, or it was just sort of a, a byproduct and we we're just sort of detecting this inactive metabolite. Um, when do people start figuring out that this is the component of ayahuasca and that, that this is, uh, you know, the spirit molecule as Rick Strassman called it. Hmm. Those are, uh, sort of, sort of two separate events. And, uh, when it, it was discovered that DMT was a component of ayahuasca, uh, I think around the mid 20th century. So around, around the 1950s or so. Um, and that was, uh, like I said, the result of, um, ethnobotanists and ethnographers who were studying, uh, indigenous cultures in the Amazon and in South America, bringing back plant samples or bringing back samples of ayahuasca or participating in ayahuasca ceremonies, and then bringing those samples back and then, uh, using Western scientific methods to discover that, that DMT was the active component. Um, interesting note. That's also, uh, it's just such a cool story that the ayahuasca story, the fact that, um, not just one indigenous culture, but, you know, dozens, uh, of indigenous cultures across many different countries across South America independently made this discovery of the combination of, of different plant admixtures that can result in the hallucinogenic effects of ayahuasca. And it's not just a hallucinogenic brew. It's this really important ceremonial and medicinal concoction that's, that's widely used across many different cultures. And, and these two plants, it's, it's a, it's a mul multiple plants that are used, but there's sort of two that are, are particularly important for ayahuasca. And these plants, these combination of these plants was found amongst some of the greatest botanical diversity in the world. You know, there's 30,000 species of vascular plants in the, in the Amazon. And the fact that these indigenous cultures have made this, um, chemical discovery is, uh, kind of a feat of, uh, of science. That's not really explainable. Interesting. Yeah. Because, you know, if you, th I think another way of saying what you just said is, so there are many different cultures in Central and South America that are combining plants in a way that results in an ayahuasca experience. So they're combining ultimately DMT with the MAOIs that enable it to be orally active. So there's a couple interesting things uh, I want to ask you about here. So one, do we know that they all independently discovered this or is it possible that the ayahuasca brew was discovered just a long time ago and sort of as people spread throughout Central and South America, they all inherited this culturally. Um, or is there clear evidence that, you know, th no, these, these cultures were in complete isolation and they totally independently discovered this? Yeah, it's, it's a really good point. Um, I, I sort of lean toward the latter that it was an independent discovery. Um, but 
uh, and and I sort of I sort of hypothesize that because of the geographical separation of of the groups that discovered it and and the and the wide geographical range of discovery. Mm. Um, but but you're right. There could have been some some knowledge and information passed passed among groups. So that's that's a good point. <laughs> okay, so it's used in multiple cultures. That, I mean, presumably, right? The, there's many cultures sort of in between them that don't use it. So it either had to have been lost many times, or or it was independently discovered. But I think what you're saying is th- this is super fascinating. How is it that people living in the jungle? <laughs> that don't have chemistry labs and things like this. How did they figure this out? Because there's literally like millions of plants in the Amazon jungle. If you were to just randomly start sampling them and mixing them together at random, you would probably never happen upon the exact right combinations. And yet, if multiple cultures are using this, the question is really, by what method did they make this discovery? Is there any is there any information there? Like, if have people asked them, how did you how did you guys discover this? Yeah, it's pretty simple. They um, they speak to the plants. <laughs> um, that's that's the answer you get, or that's the answer I've heard. There's uh, there's there's a communication with uh, with nature in a way that is not uh, accessible or uh, reasonable or normal for us for for maybe us in in modern scientific labs, like, 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 as, as, as you said, um, and, you know, there's i uh, I'm not sure if you've read much into the ethnobotany of this, but, or if your listeners have, but there's, um, you know, Richard Evan Schultes was kind of the father of ethnobotany. And he talked about how this is one of the greatest mysteries of ethnobotany, how this, this discovery was made, um, amongst some of the greatest botanical diversity in the world. And, uh, one of his students, Wade Davis, was uh, a person who kind of carried on that legacy of Schultes, and 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 Wade Davis has written uh, a few books that are just fascinating, and I'd I'd recommend others to to check out some of his work. And he is um, an anthropologist who has studied a number of different uh, different cultures across the world, and one of his one of his take homes that that I've received from his work is there's just many different ways of knowing there's many different ways of accessing knowledge and accessing information. And he talks about, um, you know, Polynesians, uh, who are able to, you know, navigate by the stars and by measuring, uh, the, the, the size of the waves or the, the pattern of the pattern of the ocean, um, in ways that is just unfathomable to, to sort of modern, uh, seafarers, I, I suppose, and and many many different other um, observations of accessing knowledge via ways that are sort of difficult for us to understand. So so that's that's sort of my hypothesis with these indigenous cultures uh, in in South America. They may have some relationship with with nature that is sort of beyond beyond our capacity to to understand and that may have allowed them to to make make this to make this discovery but that's about all i can all i can say about that and so we find obviously dmt is found in certain plants psychotria viridis is is the one that you often hear about how common is dmt in the plant world because i know it's not found in just one plant it's found in a number of them how common is it and do we know anything about why the plants are producing it yeah, I, th- I think that would be such a cool study to do is to do a really thorough investigation of um, maybe maybe not even just individual plants, but like large families of plants. And let's find out how many of them actually do contain DMT, because the general notion is that people say that DMT is in everything. They say that, you know, I've, I've heard Dennis McKenna say this. Um, it's kind of like ubiquitous. You find it. You find it everywhere. Um, and from from my reading and my understanding, it's um, I generally say it's it's found in hundreds, if not thousands of species of plants. I think there's, there's research to, to say it's in the, it's in the hundreds of plants range. Um, but there hasn't been a thorough investigation to actually document how many plants are actually producing it. And, um, you know, other details about, about why or where those plants are producing it. Yeah. I mean, the default for me, when I think about these things is in, in the cases where we sort of do know why a plant is producing something that is psychoactive in a human being, uh, more often than not, it's it's a defensive function. So you know everything from nicotine to caffeine are produced in parts of the plants as insecticides, um, and these things are typically you know very bitter tasting, 
uh, alkaloids or similar compounds. And they do something like that. They dissuade herbivores from eating the plant or they literally kill insects. Right. Yeah. Yeah. A defense protection defense mechanism is a, is a um, pretty, pretty valid hypothesis, I would say. And I think that's, that's even come up with uh, psilocybin and, and different fungi, you know, why do, why do fungi produce psilocybin? It likely a defense mechanism. Um, another interesting thing about, about DMT and plants is that it's, it's, it's a metabolite of one of the most important and uh, widely functional hormones in plants. And that's auxin or endolacetic acid mm. and endolacetic acid in plants is, is, kind of like serotonin in mammals. It, it does everything, you know, it's like, it's involved in every process and it's, uh, it's, it's very, um, it's, it's very important. And, and DMT is a, a primary metabolite of that. So that suggests that it's, it's likely, it's likely found in, in most, if not all plant species. Interesting. Um, yeah, that's, I didn't know that that's, that's fascinating. Um, so it's in plants, it's in animals, at least in trace quantities. Before we get to your work, we're, you know, we're, we're going to be going into uh, the mammalian brain and talking about endogenous DMT there. Was it found at you know, what we would think of as significant or potentially you know, biologically functional levels in any animal tissue in, in historical research? Um, historical research, I guess it depends on how you, how you define that. Um, anything, anything before your stuff? Yeah, there was uh, at, at, at least one paper that showed that DMT was present in the rodent brain at concentrations that are pretty close to serotonin and dopamine. Yeah. And that paper was done in the, in the lab that I worked in. It was published right before I joined the lab. Got it. Okay. Oh, I didn't actually know it was the same lab. Okay. So uh, yeah, I want to talk about that study. Actually, maybe before we do that, why don't we... Um, why don't we go back to the early nineties? So at this point, you know, we know what DMT right. is. We know it's found in plants. It's found in animals. We know it's part of the ayahuasca brew. It can be rendered orally active. We know that it can be injected and, um, you can hallucinate on it. Um, Terrence McKenna has been, you know, ranting and raving for a while by this time. So we know that you can smoke it and that it has very potent hallucinatory effects. When did Rick Strassman start researching it? And can you summarize that body of work for people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a little bit we skipped to that I think is important to touch on leading up to, to Strassman's work. Um, so so after, after it was discovered that DMT was an endogenous compound in, in human bodily fluids, and Stephen Sara started administering it to himself and others intramuscularly showing that it had hallucinogenic effects, this theory arose um, that perhaps... If, if DMT is endogenous and it causes hallucinations, perhaps it's causing psychotic disorders or schizophrenic type type uh, hallucinations. Mm. And it was actually labeled as a, as a schizotoxin. So that was a hypothesis that was investigated pretty extensively between, um, I'd say, about 1960 and leading up to Strassman's work in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, Stephen Barker, who's kind of one of the godfathers of DMT research, uh, published a really nice review on that. And he looked at all of the studies and I think it's about 65 studies that had confirmed DMT in bodily fluids in humans and looking at a comparison of um, uh, psychotic versus non-psychotic patients and whether there's any kind of correlations or uh, relationships between DMT levels and occurrences of, of schizophrenic type, type symptoms. And it's largely come to the conclusion that there's that there's not a correlation there. That there's no uh, there's no evidence to support that endogenous DMT is contributing to the symptoms of schizophrenia or psychotic conditions. Um, but it's still the hypothesis is not put to bed um, in, in my mind. There's still there's still a lot we don't know in terms of how DMT is regulated or stored or packaged or mm -hmm. uh, function uh, in in different bodily tissues. So so there's still I think reason to mm -hmm. investigate that. But, but I guess but, the idea there was was. And, and there's there's a lot of this floating around in the mid 20th century, right? Like in, in the early days of LSD research, that mm -hmm. you know something like schizophrenia might be explained by a molecule. For some reason, mm -hmm. the body produces something. Maybe it's LSD, maybe it's DMT, maybe it's who knows what, and this is causing the psychotic symptoms um, that you see in things like schizophrenia. So I guess the idea was, if that's true, if a schizophrenic is a schizophrenic because his body starts producing a bunch of DMT, you would then be able to detect higher levels of DMT in something like the cerebrospinal fluid. And you're saying that people sort of checked the data there and there wasn't obviously a relationship. Right. Yeah, exactly. And and I think you maybe alluded to this, but it's 
Um, to me, the the hypothesis comes off as a bit reductionist, you know, to for us to come and say that this really complex psychotic disorder, this uh, you know, that causes hallucinations and paranoia and all sorts of different things, is is uh, you know one mo- one molecule is responsible for that. It's it's a little bit reductionist in my mind to to take that stance, um, but it's but it's not to say that that uh, DMT or other endogenous psychoactive compounds might be uh, contributing. To, to some of those symptoms. Like there, there could be a role for DMT there. And um, you're right that it has been sort of checked off of like, yeah, we, we, we don't think that that there's a correlation between DMT levels and um, and psychotic symptoms. Um, but there's, but granted, there's a lot we don't know about the regulation of endogenous DMT too. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's perfectly conceivable that, you know, something could be synthesized, released, doing stuff that's interesting. And by the time you can detect it all the way down, you know, from the fluid you get in a spinal tap, it may not look different, even though it was uh, at some intervening step in the process. Um, right. But yeah. anyways, okay. So anyways, yeah. there's DMT so, inside of us. We don't know what it's doing. We can detect it at small levels. Um, sort of what what happens next in the history of the research? Yeah. Thanks for summarizing all these parts as we go along. It's helpful too. Yeah. So so we so we've got this. It's the transmethylation hypothesis too. Is what we just what we just summarized there. So now we've got this transmethylation hypothesis that's floating around and um, some people are still interested in it and we still uh, still want to investigate investigate that. And uh, Rick Strassman comes around and I, I actually, I think the story's already been told. I listened to the Dave Nichols uh, episode and he was talking about when him and um, Dr. Strassman were at uh, uh, Esalon, I think, and they had talked about, you know, initiating these DMT studies. Um so I think I think a lot of that did fuel Strassman's interests, the transmethylation hypothesis, this idea that uh, we have this endogenous psychedelic compound in our bodies, and we want to know what it does. We're curious about that. That's just an interesting question, um, and also that it may have some sort of therapeutic benefit as well. So I think that that was that fueled some of the interest, and um, those guys got got a study started at the University of New Mexico, and that. Uh, in that study, they administered intravenous DMT at uh, a few different doses, and then just really did like kind of a basic physiological and subjective uh, assessment. So this was uh, actually the kind of the first, maybe not the first, but one of the first clinical trials in in the modern psychedelic age that kind of kickstarted the psychedelic renaissance. It, it's been credited with being one of the one of the trials that that started modern psychedelic research. Um, and um, through that book or th- through that work, uh, Dr. Strassman published the DMT, the spirit molecule, and which is a documentary and a, and a, and a book of the same name. And he put forth a few uh, somewhat provocative hypotheses relating the uh, occurrence of endogenous DMT to different processes of dying or near death experiences. And that was, uh, yeah, I think that was kind of kind of the essence of, of some of that work, mm-hmm. without going into the details too much. And and can you give people just a sense for you know the time course of the effects, the nature of the hallucinations, um, anything else that we know about the fit? This just the, the raw physiological effects. You know, what's it doing to your heartbeat? Is there any evidence of toxicity or anything like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the, the effects are very, are very short lived relative to most other psychedelics. Um, generally DMT when used recreationally, it's, it's, uh, vaporized and, and inhaled. And in the Strassman study, it was injected intravenously. And in both of those routes of administration, the effects typically last approximately uh, 10 minutes or less peak effects, potentially five minutes or less. Um, and then usually within about fif- 15 minutes total, um, the effects are, uh, completely unnoticeable. So it's a very rapid acting psychedelic and, um, very powerful in terms of um, subjective effects. So uh, users often report being sort of transported into an alternate dimension or reality, um, going through some sort of um, breaking through some sort of uh, portal or some sort of uh, barrier into an alternate dimension and coupled with, you know, kaleidoscopic uh, visual effects, um, closed eye hallucinations, um, sometimes interactions with different um, entities or alien li- type life forms, or maybe even uh, like ancestor type type forms, um, and 
then sort of returning back to back to reality after this extreme feeling of like disembodiment and being separated from your physical body and then returning back to reality and um, having the effects be almost completely subsided within, like I said, about 15 minutes. Um, physiological effects, it's uh, uh, not toxic. There, there's no, there's ha hasn't been any toxicity uh, associated with it. Um, you know, increased, increased heart rate and increased blood pressure kind of, um, expected effects from, from the, from the drug. Um, and I think that's, yeah. In terms of the hallucinations and the subjective effects, they are both very intense. They're completely immersive. As long as you take enough, um, you know, like you said, people report, it's as if, you know, the entire world is replaced and you're going into a different reality. So the super intense effects, they're also short lived. Do we know why these two things are true? Why is it that the effects are so short and why is it they seem to be so intense? Does it have something to do with um, interacting with specific receptors in the brain beyond the classic psychedelic receptor? Does it have to do with the drug being metabolized super quickly? What, what explains these features? I think it's a, it's a, it's a couple of things. And uh, one important thing is, is the route of administration uh, because it's either smoked or injected intravenously. I think if you look at some of the... Um, older studies when they injected psilocybin intravenously, you also see very short effects uh, or shortened effects compared to the oral administration of psilocybin. And that's just because it gets absorbed super quickly through the um, intravenous administration and then therefore uh, can get cleared quickly as well. Uh, so that causes a very rapid onset and then a um, short, short duration. And also, yeah, DMT is also very rapidly metabolized by monoamine oxidases, which are Pre present widespread throughout the body. Um, so the combination of the route of administration and rapid metabolism, I think results in the, in the fast onset and the short duration. And um, so the serotonin 2A receptor is the one people normally talk about when they talk about psychedelics. This is the, the, the receptor that is necessary for the effects of most classic psychedelics. If you prevent DMT or psilocybin or LSD from interacting with the serotonin 2A receptor, most, if not all of the psychedelic effects go away. However, most of the classic psychedelics are not just interacting with that receptor. They're, inter they're each interacting with a sort of a different pattern of receptors to different extents each. For, for DMT, beyond the 5-HD2A receptor, is it interacting with other receptors? And is there anything interesting that we've learned there? Yeah. So uh, the effects of DMT are have so far, thus far, been shown largely dependent on 2A receptor activation, uh, but there haven't, hasn't been quite as extensive of a body of research on DMT in that regard relative to you know, psilocybin or LSD in terms of 2A activation. Um, but it's, there's, a, there's a paper with um, 2A knockout mice, and when you administer DMT to the 2A knockout mice, the, the head twitch response is, is abolished. Head twitch response is a... Um, kind of a behavioral proxy and rodent models for psychedelic effects. So, so the 2A receptor is definitely important for, for DMT as well. Um, it also uh, interacts with a number of other serotonin receptors. I think there's maybe about a dozen other serotonin receptors that DMT does interact with. Again, not much is known there. Not, uh, ha there hasn't been much investigation into that. Um, a couple other receptor groups of interest are the trace amine associated receptors or TARS. Um, those are much less well, uh, investigated, uh, and with, with respect to serotonin receptor. So we don't really even know uh, as much about TARS as we do about the serotonin receptor, uh, complex. And then finally, the, um, the Sigma one receptors are also really important for, um, DMT pharmacology. And those have received uh, a little bit more attention. There's, uh, a group led by, I think, Ed Fresca in, uh, in Europe, and they've done quite a bit of work on looking at um, the effects of DMT on uh, protection from hypoxia and um, uh, immunological function and different, uh, and, and, and different things with uh, respect to the Sigma-1 receptor. So showing that the Sigma-1 receptor is, is an important component in mediating uh, these effects when activated by, by DMT. What's known generally about the Sigma one receptor? Hmm. You know, I don't have a, I don't have quite the knowledge to, yeah, to, hmm. to go into that. Got it. Um, 
but with you said you said protection from hypoxia. So w- what was that referring to? Mm, yeah, that was a, that was a pretty interesting study by uh, by that group I mentioned. And uh, what they did is they took um, they took cells and this was a an in vitro experiment cells in a in a dish and exposed them to hypoxic conditions, so reduced uh, oxygen concentration, and uh, supplemented the supplemented the cells with um, various different compounds, and one of them was was DMT. And what they found was with uh, increasing concentrations of DMT, they found um, increased cell survival. So the DMT appeared to be hypoxia protective for these cells that were under reduced oxygen conditions. Mm. Okay, and so they, they showed that, that that activity was dependent on the sigma one receptor activation. Got it. So hypoxia, reduced oxygen, uh, bad for cells. If you give DMT, it protects the cells in those, and this is all in a Petri dish, just, just to reiterate for people, not in a live animal. Um, the cells survive more if you give them DMT and it seems to be protecting them from, from the hypoxia that would otherwise kill them. And whatever is going on there is requ- it requires the sig- this thing called the sigma-1 receptor. So <laughs> that brings us to um, some other studies. Um, because you could look at data like that and you might think, huh, well, maybe if this molecule DMT is preventing cells from damage or death from hypoxia, maybe uh, cells in the body, maybe even neurons, store some DMT. And when hypoxic conditions arise, uh, the DMT is released and it's a, it's a protection mechanism for the cells so that they don't get killed or damaged in a low oxygen environment. When do you have a low oxygen environment? Well, I mean, if, if you're having, uh, if you're dying, basically, if you're having trouble breathing or something's happening to you. Um, and I know that this is, you know, as far as I can tell, this has sort of been Rick Strassman's idea for a while, perhaps the near death experience that we have often heard about, um, perhaps DMT is responsible for this. Perhaps the body's detecting something like low oxygen conditions and DMT can be released under uh, those types of conditions. So that uh, you said, I, I guess, I think you said earlier, this was actually in your lab that you did your PhD in where this, this next study done a few years ago happened. So, so what did they do there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a couple studies we can, we can mention here. And um, uh, I'll, I'll just say that that's, that's one of, I think the most intriguing hypotheses about uh, endogenous DMT is that it plays some hypoxia protective role. And then perhaps as uh, as a byproduct, you get psychedelic effects. It could just be, you know, protecting the body from low oxygen. Uh, so I think that's definitely an interesting hypothesis worth, worth investigating. Um, but the study I think, I think that I think you're alluding to was published by uh, John Dean, who uh, worked in the lab in Gmo Borjigan's lab, where I started my PhD. He kind of finished up as I was, as I was just starting. Uh, and that paper got published right when I started. And what they did was um, implanted this um, horizontal microdialysis probe across the occipital cortex of rats. So this is um, this is much larger than a traditional microdialysis sampling setup that you would see in um, in most rodent studies. Most rodent studies have sort of a single probe that goes uh, kind of vertically into the brain, and you're only sampling about like one or two millimeters of tissue. This horizontal probe actually transverse the in- in- entire occipital cortex, and um, I'll just mention here, and we can talk about it later. But they also uh, took out the pineal gland of of rats too, and, and measured measured DMT with and without the pineal gland. Can but, you can uh, you explain that part, like why they would have done that to begin with? Right. So it's it's for, it's for for a while it's been assumed that the pineal gland is uh, well. It's been hypothesized that the, hypo- the the pineal gland might be responsible for uh, for DMT production and. It kind of goes. It goes kind of way back to uh, to Descartes, who thought that the pineal gland was kind of the the seat of the soul. Um, and it's this interesting. It's this interesting um, part of the brain that there's. Uh, you know, most most brain structures have have two sides. It's uh, they're two sided, but the pineal gland is just a single gland in the center of the brain, and it's uh, it's uh, it's very unique in that sense. And it, it plays a big role in. Um, Regulating circadian circadian sleep cycles and producing mm-hmm. melatonin, um, and melatonin is actually structurally uh, quite similar to DMT, um, and it's got enzymes. In the pineal gland contains enzymes necessary for the biosynthesis of DMT. So it had long been hypothesized that you know maybe the pineal gland is kind of the the the, cent- the central hub of, of DMT production. Interesting. So so, so the pineal, pineal gland's in the center of the brain. 
I believe, I believe it's known to be the exclusive source of melatonin in the brain. Melatonin is very similar structurally to DMT. And I think you said that the pineal gland has the enzymes that we know would be needed to make DMT. So apart from detecting DMT there directly, all of the pieces for DMT production seem to be in that part of the brain. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the enzymes we'll just mention, so we can maybe talk about them later are um, AADC, which is aromatic amino acid decarboxylase that turns uh, tryptophan into tryptamine. And then the other enzyme that's thought to be responsible for DMT production is INMT. And that's endolethylamine in methyltransferase. And that turns tryptamine into dimethyltryptamine. So it methylates it. Um, and we can talk a bit about that too, because I have some other work that I've um, done to, to discuss that. But just all that to say that in the study by, by John Dean in 2019, they tested, tested the levels of DMT in pineal intact and then pineal ectomized rats. And the uh, interesting thing is that they found that there was no difference in DMT levels between, between these two groups, suggesting that the pineal gland is in fact not necessary for endogenous DMT production in the brain. And that's, um, that's DMT levels in the occipital cortex of the brain. Right. So this, uh, the pineal gland sits, uh, in the, ox uh, just above the occipital cortex. So this trans, this microdialysis probe, uh, went right through the occipital cortex and went through the pineal gland, uh, and transverse that, that whole area horizontally. And, and, and was that study when, when they're detecting DMT there with or without the pineal gland are, is it just animals under baseline conditions that are awake? Are they asleep? Are they anesthetized? What's what, what are the conditions there? Yeah, just, just baseline conditions. Yeah, it's a pretty cool setup where it's just an automated system. The animals are connected to the microdialysis probes and it feeds automatically into an HPLC, which measures the levels of, of DMT. And and they were, I think they were measuring measuring rats for like days at a time. It, they just kind of had this automated system and it would uh, inject into the HPLC, measure it and continue collecting. So just baseline conditions. And were these, you know, teeny tiny levels of DMT or were they levels comparable to other neurotransmitters and things in the brain that we know are doing stuff? Comparable to other levels of neurotransmitters. Yeah. This study in particular didn't actually measure the levels of, uh, say serotonin or dopamine or norepinephrine or anything like that. But if you cite other research or reference other research, you'll see that, um, the levels were, were within that range. And it's in, I think it's about one, one to two nanomolar is about the average levels that they were detecting. I see. So they detected DMT. Did they do any control measurements of other endogenous compounds at all? No, uh, not not that I know of. I have to I have to check, but I don't think they they might have actually measured. Mm, no, you know, I'm, I'm I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to go back and look at that one. You really want? We'll, that. We'll, have to, we'll have to take a look. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I can't quite remember. Uh, and then what was the other big experiment there? I, I believe in this one they were basically looking at animals that were. Um, had experimentally induced cardiac arrest. Right. That's kind of how we got onto all this. Yeah. Um, so we talked about uh, this kind of near death connection or this dying connection to DMT and this hypothesis that DMT might be hypoxia protective, might be released under low oxygen conditions. So they set, they set to test that. And with these microdialysis probes implanted in the occipital cortex, um, they subjected the rats to experimental cardiac arrest, which is a, uh, CO2 induction. So putting CO2 into the air and uh, eliminating oxygen. And what they found there was, um, I think it was a, about a six fold increase in, in DMT levels um, following the cardiac arrest event in, in rats. And it was a significant increase statistically. So that suggests that there's, um, suggests that DMT is responding. It's, there's, there's a physiological response that's causing DMT to increase. Mm -hmm. um, albeit a very intense physiological response. Um, you know, cardiac arrest is a very stressful and intense event, uh, but it does suggest that there's some physiologically mediated release of DMT, which is yeah. one important, which is one important component. If you were setting out to characterize DMT as a neurotransmitter or as a signaling molecule, you would want to, you would want to show physiologically dependent uh, release or activation. Yes. I think an important distinction there is, you know, one of the criticisms of that work would be that this is a very intense stimulus. You're inducing cardiac arrest, and there's a difference between uh, the regulated release, say, of a neurotransmitter through, you know, an, a calcium-dependent excitation mechanism, like you know, 
uh, a neuro- normal neurotransmitter that's packaged in a vesicle. It's sitting there. It's waiting for an act potential, and it goes out like a very regulated uh, process. Versus something like this, which could be, it could just be that you're basically killing the animal, and everything is getting dumped out all at once, um, w- which would be a, a different thing, right? Yeah, which which is actually I think which is true because um, the lab. Uh, GMO's lab, the lab that I'm discussing, the where uh, that that published this work, did that study, and they measured a number of other neurotransmitters uh, following cardiac arrest. Mm. You know, uh, glutamate, GABA, serotonin, uh, dopamine, norepinephrine, all those things, and and they all they all spike massively after cardiac arrest. So there's um, this is a like I said, a very stressful, intense physiological event, and likely the brain is going into some sort of protection mode, and everything's getting dumped out. Okay. So we know that the DMT is there. It's there before that happens. It goes up after that happens along with everything else going up. Um, so we at least know that there's some amount of DMT there that's, you know, we don't, I don't think we know where it is, right? We don't know if it's in vesicles or it's packaged somewhere else, but it does seem to be there. Right. But I'll, I'll also say um, another limitation of this study is that the sampling time is 12 and a half minutes. So we're collecting mm. a sample every 12 and a half minutes. And if you're thinking about an intense cardiac arrest event, it's probably going to happen on the scale of seconds or less. I see. Um, and if we're, we're gr- grouping all that into a 12 and a half minute sample, then we're likely missing a lot of the uh, important nuance of that, of, of that process. Mm-hmm. So based on that evidence, would you say it shows that there is endogenous DMT in the brain under baseline conditions? Or would you like, like what, what, what are the conclusions you would actually draw from that study that you think are rock solid? I think that's the main conclusion. Yeah. And that was, that was actually the first study to show that uh, DMT is present in the, in the living rodent brain, freely behaving rodent brain. A lot of the older studies that had showed DMT in the brain, it's like postmortem tissues. So, Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, it's still valid, but this is, uh, sort of showing that, uh, that DMT is, is present in the, in the freely behaving rodent brain. So I think that's probably the, the most solid, um, takeaway from that study. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I guess the, a question at this point is, is, is the DMT there because it's only to protect the brain from hypoxia or something like that under special conditions? Is it some kind of, you know, stress protection type molecule or, you know, the more provocative, the more interesting hypothesis would be, no, it's actually used as something like a neurotransmitter. And so, you know, unpack that for us, like what, what the thinking is there, what the hypotheses were and how that feeds into the work that you did. Yeah. So I think, I think it would need uh, a lot more evidence to be characterized as a neurotransmitter. Um, the hypoxia hypothesis is a very interesting one, and it seems there, there's some data out there to suggest that it is, uh, functioning in a, in a hypoxia protective role, but in order to characterize a molecule as a neurotransmitter, there's a, there's a number of, uh, criteria that have to be met. And if you look at some of the canonical neurotransmitters like serotonin, um, you'll see that there's, um, there's specialized neurons for their synthesis. So we have serotonergic neurons and those neurons have the enzymes necessary for the biosynthesis of serotonin. So we would need that, need that for DMT. We would need DMT or JIC neurons, which, uh, which, which there may be another, another finding of that study by, by John Dean is, um, the co-localization of those two enzymes, INMT and AADC, uh, was found in a number of different, uh, brain regions in the, I think in the cortex, in the, uh, choroid plexus and, um, in the pineal gland as well. So that, that those could be areas where there are, um, quote unquote, DMT ergic neurons. So that's one criteria for, um, for, for a neurotransmitter. Uh, another criteria is that there's, um, a mechanism to, uh, package and store the neurotransmitter in, in vesicles. Uh, that's generally done to protect the neurotransmitter from metabolic degradation and to sort of store and sequester it so that it can be released via exocytosis in a, in a concentrated, uh, package. Um, another criteria is that once that vesicle is released via exocytosis, that the the neurotransmitter activates a postsynaptic receptor. There's some receptor um, on the other side of that presynaptic neuron that gets activated and causes a downstream physiological response. Um, another criteria is that after that postsynaptic receptor has been activated, the molecule would need to be uh, recycled or metabolized 
in some way. And often that's a, that's a reuptake mechanism. Like for serotonin, it's CERT. It's the serotonin transporter that can take serotonin back into that um, serotonergic neuron and then either metabolize it or package it back into a vesicle. Um, and that, that exocytosis has to be activity dependent. There has to be some, some physiological response that's causing that exoc exocytosis. Um, so th those characteristics um, still need to be worked out if, if we're going to start to call DMT a neurotransmitter or a, a neurosignaling molecule even. Um, and there, there's a bit of evidence um, kind of for each of those. So you could, you could very loosely kind of put together a hypothesis that, that, um, suggests that DMT is a neurotransmitter, but it's, but it's not, it's not quite solid. And a lot of it's from, from pre-1980. Um, so there hasn't been much, much modern investigation mm -hmm. into it. So is a fair summary. So, so all those criteria need to be met before you can say something is a bona fide neurotransmitter in an animal brain. We know that there's some DMT there, we don't know how it's packaged. Is it in a synaptic vesicle? Is it packaged some other way? Um, we know that obviously DMT can activate postsynaptic receptors, um, in, right? Like there's 5-HT2A receptors in the brain. If it is being packaged like a neurotransmitter, which no one has proven yet, you know, there, there would be receptors there for it to activate. Um, but we, you know, we 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 don't have those other pieces, right? We don't know if it's in vesicles. We don't know if there's act neuronal activity dependent release. We don't know if there's uh, a reuptake mechanism. So you know, the jury's still out. Right. Yeah. And like I said, there's some loose evidence, like, um, there's a paper, but a paper by Nick Cozy, and he showed that DMT acts at both the serotonin transporter at CERT and also at VMAT2. And VMAT2 is a, a vesicular transport, um, vesicular trans transporter. So it can package the DMT into, into vesicles. Um, but we're not sure whether that, um, VMAT2 or CERT co-localize with INMT and AEDC to produce these, you know, DMT ergic neurons. Um, so yeah, there's, there's still, there's still quite a bit of work to do in, in, in that field. Okay, cool. Um, so then we've got your work on endogenous DMT. Um, can you set that work up for us and describe like what motivated it and what the, what you set out to look for? Hmm. Yeah, we, so it, it, it had pretty long been assumed, uh, based on the work by, by Dean, uh, at all that, that I mentioned before, um, because that, because that work showed that INMT and AADC are co-localizing in different cortical neurons and, and different regions of the brain. So basically everybody in the field is assuming that INMT is the, is the critical enzyme for DMT biosynthesis and we're basically using that as an anatomical marker of where DMT might be produced. So we're saying if we can if we can isolate INMT or if we can show where INMT is expressed, that's likely a region where DMT is is being produced. Um, so we wanted to investigate that. We wanted to look into the enzyme INMT and um, find out a little bit more about it. So so we developed an INMT knockout rat model. And if we're, if we're operating under the assumption that INMT is the key enzyme for DMT biosynthesis, then the standard hypothesis, the obvious hypothesis is that an INMT knockout rat would be unable to produce DMT, would be unable to uh, methylate tryptamine to, ma to make DMT. So that's what we kind of set out to look at. Um, because if you go back to a lot of the a lot of the old research, there's there's actually a bit of ambiguity in terms of um, how INMT actually got characterized as as the key synthetic enzyme. Um, so our work kind of kind of morphed into well, does INMT actually do what everybody says it does? And is it the enzyme that synthesizes DMT, or is it the only enzyme that does it, or is there more to the story? Um, so that that kind of that kind of sets it up and. Um, when what's we first, the, what's the punchline here? <laughs> when, when, when we first, when we first generated the, the INMT knockout, knockout rat model, we didn't see, we didn't see much difference, you know, like sleep patterns were normal. Um, um, yeah, sleep was normal. Reproduction was normal. Uh, basically, basically everything that we, that we observed was, uh, was normal between the wild type and the knockout rats. Um, so so we we started to run um, enzyme assays to find out whether or not INMT was actually um, was actually necessary for tryptamine methylation, and we kind of went back to the old literature of um, of using tissue extracts and um, 
tissue extracts from from rodent models to test the methylation of uh, tryptamine. Mm -hmm. And um, what we found there was that um, INMT was actually not necessary for tryptamine methylation in, in the rats. So we saw that wild type and knockout rats both methylated tryptamine at equal levels, suggesting that INMT is not necessary. So basically you showed that um, the uh, enzymatic mechanism that people assumed was the only way to make DMT is not. Right. Right. Um, and we were just running um, sort of crude um, tissue extracts. And there's a number of different enzymes within those tissue extracts. And we're incubating them with tryptamine. And there's a lot of different things going on in that sort of in vitro experiment. So we set out to kind of do a, a more of a careful careful assessment of that. And we generated uh, recombinant INMT protein, and we generated that protein in, uh, in rats, humans, and in, in rabbits. So if you go to the historical literature, you'll see that rabbits were uh, tested quite extensively in terms of um, tryptamine methylation and INMT activity. They seem to have a really high expression of INMT in the lung and a uh, 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 high ability to methylate tryptamine to, to, to make DMT. So we wanted to, uh, wanted to assess the recombinant INMT in, in rats, rabbits, and humans. And we found that in uh, human and rabbit INMT, uh, clear methylation of tryptamine to produce DMT, but with rat INMT, it was inactive toward tryptamine. So this suggested that uh, in rats, at least, INMT is, uh, this was further evidence that INMT is not, not necessary for uh, tryptamine methylation. What um, what happened when you started giving rodents IV DMT? What things did you look at? Yeah, we were uh, really just interested in doing a kind of a um, broad characterization of the effects of, of DMT in rodents. So there's been maybe a, a handful of studies that have investigated the effects of DMT in humans over the last decade or two, but very few, if any, that have investigated that in, in rodent models. And we feel that rodent models could be uh, an important uh, an important model to develop for future mechanistic studies to understand understand the role of of, of DMT and and the the pharmacology of it. So we were we partnered with a group in the chemistry department and measured a whole panel of neurotransmitters before, during, and after intravenous intra, intravenous DMT in rats. And there, I think there was about seventeen different uh, neurotransmitters we measured, including serotonin and dopamine. Um, and DMT. Uh, and then we also did a uh, high density EEG. So we implanted 32 screw electrodes on the, on the rat skull and measured, um, measured EEG and looked at functional connectivity and uh, spectral power and uh, things like that. And we also did a, a bit of behavioral analysis with uh, the head twitch response. And so for the, so I want to talk about the experiments where you're actually measuring DMT levels in the brain. So Question, there's two, two, two questions here. One, which parts of the brain were you looking in and why? And then question two is, how much DMT did you find there? Mm, right. So we were interested in the uh, prefrontal cortex and the somatosensory cortex. And prefrontal cortex, I think, for obvious reasons, because of its role in executive functioning and high expression of serotonin 2A receptors. Um, and the somatosensory cortex was, it was a region that uh, our group had been interested in it was a region that our group had been interested in um, for for the past several years. Um, we had done different experiments with um, different experiments with uh, with ketamine and nitrous oxide, and we we saw some interesting interesting trends with the somatosensory cortex in terms of acetylcholine levels. Um, so those were the two regions we were interested in, and we were measuring them not with a traditional microdialysis probe, but with a open flow microperfusion probe. And this is uh, kind of an important part of the study because it allowed us to to actually improve the analyte recovery and get a get kind of a, a better picture of of what's going on neurochemically in those regions. And we had had trouble in the past uh, measuring the levels of DMT in in these brain regions. Um, but we, we thought that 
if we're administering DMT intravenously, then that's going to cause a massive spike in the brain. So this is going to allow us to sort of develop a method to be able to detect DMT in the brain because it's going to be such high levels. It'll be very easy to detect. Mm. So after we started uh, uh, administering DMT IV, we saw huge spikes in DMT and we're like, okay, now we know, now we know what the DMT peak looks like on our HPLC. So we were like, okay, let's, let's try and measure it during, during baseline conditions now, because now we've got the method worked out. Um, I see. I see. So flood the brain with a lot of DMT. So it's easy to detect. You can fine tune your method for, for knowing how to see it when it's there. So now you're going back to baseline conditions to, uh, and now you've got a really good tool so that you know it when you see it, if it's there. Exactly. Yeah. And that was, that was some of the trouble of er in the early days when we had the INMT knockout rats, because the first experiment is like, well, why don't you take the knockout rats and measure the DMT levels in their brain? Well, we couldn't, we couldn't do it. It was so low. We just couldn't quite, quite get that measurement worked out. But later on when we started administering the, D the DMT IV, yeah, like you said, we had a clear, clear method and it was much easier to do. Um, so, so at that point we had this open flow microperfusion, which is another benefit of the study allows us to kind of improve recovery and, um, with that, we were able to measure DMT under baseline conditions, and then we were able to track it throughout the entirety of the experiment after we administered it int intravenously. Mm -hmm. And then I'm doing a screen share here. So um, we're going to be really careful to describe this verbally because most people are just listening. But what are we looking at here? How much DMT did you actually find in the prefrontal and somatosensory cortex? How did that compare to other things like serotonin and dopamine? Yeah, so it uh, pretty pretty straightforward. The the levels of DMT fell right within the range of serotonin and dopamine in both brain regions. So with the uh, the plot that we're looking at, this is um, basal concentrations of DMT in nanomolar levels, um, and it's showing serotonin, dopamine, and DMT for both brain regions, prefrontal and somatosensory cortex. And with serotonin, the the basal levels were looks like right around 0.8 nanomolar with dopamine right around 0.4 nanomolar, and then DMT fell right within that range, uh, about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 nanomolar in the prefrontal cortex. And then pretty much the same trend in the somatosensory cortex too. So so this measurement, so what this is really showing us is that, and this is, is this rats or mice? I forget. Rats. So in the rat brain, in prefrontal cortex and in somatosensory cortex, you can detect DMT at levels that's comparable to two other major, major neurotransmitters in the brain. Right. And yep. this is basal conditions. So the animals are alive, they're awake, they're not doing anything in particular. Um, you're not giving them DMT and there's sort of nothing special happening, just baseline conditions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We, we just, we just keep them awake. Like you said, yeah, they're alive. Um, we just don't allow them to sleep and yeah, just the baseline conditions. So this is actually, um, I, I think it's one of the, one of the bigger findings of the, uh, of this work. But it's it's basically just um, supporting what was shown in the previous paper. So mm -hmm. it's already been shown by right. by John Dean's work that DMT is level is present uh, in the brain at about those levels. One of the differences is that uh, John Dean and the others they were measuring in occipital cortex. This is in both frontal and uh, sensory cortex, uh, which is the first measurement in those brain regions. Yeah, and I mean this would imply that, um, I mean, like plausibly, it's just found throughout cortex. Right. Yeah. And this would, this would support the, the work from, from John Dean showing that INMT is expressed widely throughout the cortex too. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, the next figure, I'll put this up on the screen as well. Um, this is going to be an experiment where you're actually now giving animals IV DMT and you're looking at uh, DMT levels uh, across time. So it looks like you use three different doses and I'm hoping you can just unpack this result for people. Yeah, so we're giving uh, three three different doses here, and the low dose was 0 0.75 mix per kg milligrams per kilogram. Medium dose was 3.75 milligrams per kilogram. High dose was 7.5. Um, and what we did is uh, I mentioned previously that we were measuring the DMT in these 12 and a half minute epics. Uh, so it takes 12 and a half minutes to collect one sample, and the first four samples are baseline, so just uh, basal conditions. And then the next seven samples are drug conditions. So the DMT is administered at the beginning of the, of the fifth sample. And it's just a five minute bolus infusion uh, intravenously into the jugular vein. And uh, we measure the DMT in that first sample there and then all of the additional samples following that. 
I and, see. Yeah. So each of these data points is about 12 and a half minutes of time. Um, 12 and a half minutes, but it's uh, there's uh, a, a number of different rats for each data point, obviously, too. Yep. So. Yep. Okay. All average together. And we're looking at, in this case, we're looking at DMT levels at each point in time, each 12 and a half minute chunk, average across uh, multiple animals. We've got three different doses represented here. Talk talk to us about what's happening here to DMT levels, and then can you can you explain um, that in relation to the behavioral effects and how long those last? Right. So unsurprisingly, we see this dose dependent increase in DMT levels in the brain um, because we're we're administering it um, into the into the vein, and then we're measuring it in the brain. You think the more DMT you give, the more you're going to be able to measure in the brain, um, and there's a there's a large and significant spike at all three doses during the drug infusion period. Uh, following that, we we sort of group the epics into drug, post-drug, and recovery. So that just to kind of make it a little bit easier, um, the post-drug encompasses the uh, D3 through through D5 epics, and then the recovery is just the D6 and D7 uh, epics. And there's also um, sort of a, a dose-dependent uh, sustaining of the levels of, of DMT in the brain, where at the, at the low dose during the, the final three epics and in the recovery period, we see that the DMT levels go back to basal conditions. So they're no different from the baseline conditions, but in the medium and high doses, those levels of DMT remain significantly elevated from the basal conditions. And this is true in both the prefrontal and the somatosensory cortex. And this is uh, this is interesting because uh, if we say each each epic is about twelve and a half minutes, and the DMT was administered here at at D one or at the first first drug epic, there's seven epics there times twelve and a half minutes. That's uh, 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 maybe about an hour and a half, and that that indicates that when DMT is administered intravenously, uh, ninety minutes later or more, we can still detect high, significantly elevated levels of DMT in the brain. And this is interesting, I think, because this is not the trend you would see if you were measuring DMT in the blood. Uh, if you administered DMT, intro, like this, this is the way that it's done in, in the human studies, you administer DMT uh, into the vein, and then you're also measuring the DMT from circulation as well. And you see that uh, DMT is, is, is cleared from the blood much faster than it is from uh, what, what we see here in the brain. And that suggests that there could be some potential storage or sequestration mechanism uh, in the brain that's allowing the DMT to remain uh, significantly concentrated there for, uh, for a prolonged period of time. I see. So it doesn't prove this, but it suggests the possibility that there's some way to store DMT in the brain for extended periods of time. Right. Yeah. Because, because this is not what you would expect if you were measuring DMT in, in the mm -hmm. plasma or in the blood. Yeah, it would it would spike and then drop off much more quickly, probably within these first two time points, right? Right, exactly. And okay, interesting. How long? So, if you're just assessing the animals behaviorally, so let's say you're looking at the classic head twitch response in animals, which is our proxy for hallucinogenic effects, what would that look like in comparison to this? So, so for example, at you know D three, D four, D five. Um, especially the higher doses, you've still got elevated DMT levels in the brain of these rats. Do they look behaviorally normal at that point, or do they still have a head twitch response or other indications that they are tripping basically? Right. So the, yeah, thanks for bringing that back up. The, the behavioral response was, was also dose dependent. And I think, I think what, I think what I wrote in the results was that uh, with, with the low dose, the, the behavioral effects last approximately 10 to 15 minutes, medium dose, um, maybe 15 to 25 minutes, and then the high dose, you know, up to 35 or 40 minutes. And the head twitch response is actually a very, very acute response. It, it happens mm. in the first uh, 10 minutes uh, from the start of DMT administration to uh, 10 minutes after that. After that, you, you, won't see, you won't see any head twitch. So they all occur in, the, in that D1 period there. I see. So the, the classic head twitch response that people use to assess something's hallucinogenic uh, potential, that would all be occurring in this first 12 and a half minute D1 time period here. Do the, do the, other, do the animals do any other behaviors that indicate that they're having a drug effect after that time point? Yeah. So those are the, those are the dose dependent effects that I just described the, the, the different durations there. But, um, but what, like what exactly are they, how do you tell, what are the behaviors? 
Right. Yeah. So the animals will uh, kind of, we, we, we call it pancaking. They'll kind of splay out their, their hind legs will be splayed back. Um, there will be some head weaving. So the head will kind of rhythmically weave left and right. Um, there's the, they call it four paw treading. So they're kind of like digging, uh, digging with their, with their front paws. There sometimes this phenomenon of like straw tail where the, the, the tail kind of curls up, points upward, becomes erect and almost points forward. Um, and then sometimes even some backward walking at the very high doses. Hmm. And, and some of the, some of these, um, behavioral responses have been noted in, uh, serotonin syndrome or excessive serotonin receptor activation. So it could be related to, uh, mm-hmm. the excessive high dose causing over activation of serotonin receptors. I see. Um, and maybe we'll come back to this later if we have time, but I'm, I'm just going to say this to put it in my own memory. What you're saying is there are clear behavioral indications of the hallucinogenic effects of a drug like DMT, even when the animals aren't engaged in a head twitch response. Well, uh, y- you said hallucinogenic effects, and we don't know that the animals are hallucinating. So there's 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 behavioral effects, mm. but we're not sure if they're hallucinogenic. Yeah, let me say that. Let me say that a slightly different way. Um, the head twitch response is hasu- um, presumed to be a proxy for hallucination and the hallucinations that would occur in humans when we study these things in animals who we can't get inside the minds of. Um, but there are reliable behaviors these animals will display to known human hallucinogens um, when, even in the absence of head twist re- responses. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. Um, interesting. Okay. Maybe we'll come back to that. Um, but uh, okay. So, so uh, what is this, uh, what is this next experiment showing us here? Uh, next one here is looking at the effects of IV DMT on the levels of serotonin and dopamine in both of these brain regions. I see. So you're basically asking if you give an animal DMT, does it change the levels of other neurotransmitters in the brain? Exactly. Yeah. And with these two neurotransmitters specifically, it does, uh, particularly for the the medium and the high doses during the drug effect. So, so it's an acute effect. And in the, in the prefrontal cortex, we see that the levels of serotonin spike during the drug epic, uh, for the medium and the high dose. And then for dopamine that happens at the high dose during, during the drug epic. And then in somatosensory cortex, it's a, it's a similar pattern. Interesting. All right. So you find DMT in the brain. Um, it obviously goes up when you give IV DMT. That's what we just looked at. It actually stays elevated at the higher doses for longer than you may have, might have expected, um, previously, um, longer than it stays, um, at high levels in the blood. You're seeing here that it's also increasing levels of, uh, dopamine and serotonin, um, and did you, did you guys look at anything uh, else or just uh, serotonin and dopamine? We did. We had that whole panel of uh, about 17 different neurotransmitters. And I, I feel like that might be this next figure here. Um, so yeah, this is looking at uh, a whole, whole panel. There's, there's acetylcholine, there's GABA, glutamate, um, and then a number of different amino acids, um, histamine, glutamine, glucose. Yeah, just, just hmm. a number of different things. And Were there any... Yeah, the, the, okay. yeah. The the big takeaway here is that there's uh there, there were no drug effects, so there were there were no changes during the drug epic with uh, with any of these any of these neurotransmitters or signaling molecules. Uh, we we did see some changes in the in the recovery periods. So I think one interesting one is um, phenylalanine. You'll see decreases in the post drug and the recovery period in the high dose, and uh, you know, phenylalanine is a precursor for dopamine. So that could, that could relate to, um, increased dopamine production, uh, mm-hmm. something there. Um, another interesting thing is that we don't see any changes in GABA or glutamate and, uh, you know, psych- serotonergic psychedelics, classic psychedelics are thought to be glutamatergic. And a number of studies have shown that, that glutamate spikes, especially in the prefrontal cortex, uh, with it, with psychedelic administration, but we didn't see that here. And that actually, to my knowledge, hadn't had not been investigated with DMT uh, as as of yet. So I know it's been shown in, in rodent models with with psilocybin and, and other other psych- psychedelics, but had not been tested with DMT. And, and our results didn't support a, a glutamatergic response. Mm-hmm. Um, w- one one little question here um, from my own understanding: You've got three different doses that you used. Were these completely distinct cohorts of rats, or were you giving? Uh, Give, were you giving the rats the low dose, then giving the same rats the medium dose, then the same rats the high dose? Yeah, it was a repeated measure. So every rat got all three doses mm-hmm. in, a, in a randomized way. Okay, okay, in a randomized way. Yeah, got mm-hmm. it. 
Um, interesting. Okay, so um, the EEG results. Um, can you set that up for us? So give people a sense for what is EEG actually measuring, and, and what do we already know from from the literature in terms of uh, you know the human work showing what's happening uh, in response to DMT. Yeah. So so EEG is. Um... I mentioned with the, with the microanalysis measures and the neurochemical analyses, you're you've got this really poor temporal resolution. You're measuring events that are that happen over milliseconds in a in a bin of twelve and a half minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, EEG does not have that issue. Um, you're measuring um, you know a thousand times a second. You have a sampling rate of you know a thousand a thousand samples per second. And what it is is actually measuring the um, kind of summarized or collective uh, electrical activity of, of neurons ac- across the cortex. It's only it's only measuring cortical activity. So if you look at some studies with fMRI or or PET or other things like that, um, they're actually able to measure subcortical brain activity, but EEG is just focused on the cortex. And different analyses are, are conducted with EEG. One is uh, kind of the most standard is a, is a um, spectral power analysis. And that's Kind of looking at the uh, electrical activity of the cortex at different frequency bands so separating it out from the low frequency of uh, delta about one to four hertz um, up to theta alpha beta and all the way up to gamma mm-hmm. frequencies which is about greater than 30 hertz i see so so if, if we give people a, a mental image here um you know if you imagine looking at the surface of a lake on a windy day it's very choppy. There's lots of little waves going, and then a boat drives by, and it's creating you know larger, slower waves. You've got all of these waves happening, little fast ones and big slow ones. And so this is a method for counting uh, how much of uh, each type of wave you have rippling across the brain. Is that kind of a, a decent summary? Yeah, yeah, that, that's a really good summary. Yeah, you're kind of you're kind of measuring the contribution of of the little waves and the big waves, and and determining how how that contributes in terms of overall brain activity. Mm-hmm. And um, what's what's the punchline here? You give DMT, uh, what tends to, what, what are the, some of the more salient changes you see in the EEG signal? Yeah, so I think the, the two kind of takeaways was we saw um, a decrease in theta activity and increase in, in gamma activity. And um, it's, when, you, when you're doing EEG in rats or in, or in any, any rodent, it's a little bit, it's a little bit unique to interpret, a little bit different to interpret in terms of uh, relative to human studies. Mm-hmm. So one of the most um, salient or common features of DMT activity in humans is uh, alpha suppression or suppression of the alpha band. And we uh, we, we didn't quite observe that uh, in, in the rodents because the, the alpha band is not not as prominently uh, it's it's not as prominent of a, of a functional band. Mm-hmm. In rodents. So it's, it's very important for humans, but not so much for rodents. Mm-hmm. Um, but what we do see, we do see theta suppression and then the gamma activation and the, uh, gamma activation has actually been, been cited in a few different human studies. So that, that correlates with, uh, some of the previous human research and we measured gamma activity at a, at a higher frequency than you're generally able to do in, in human studies. And we, uh, specifically saw a high activity in, uh, in the high gamma range. So above, above hundred Hertz. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, is there anything, how, how do you interpret these results? Um, how, how does the brain look, how does a, a rat brain look after you give them DMT um, compared to other states they might go into going asleep, um, being anesthetized, you know, anything like that? Yeah, well, they're, they're definitely different from sleep or, or anesthesia. Um, uh, you, you, you wouldn't see gamma activation like this in, in either of those states. I think going back to what you said before is the, uh, the behavioral measures of, uh, you know, we have, we have an indication that the rats are, are experiencing, um, a hallucinogenic drug. I think the EEG kind of, kind of supports that in a, in a, in a way. And it's also, you know, this is just a characterization study. So there have, there haven't been as many studies of EEG activity in rodents. So we're, we're sort of, uh, laying the, trying to lay, lay the groundwork and, and understand mechanism through this. But I think it does provide some evidence that there is um, altered experience. I, I don't want to say you know altered state of consciousness or you know hallucinations, but it, it evidence that there's there's an there's an alteration in the phenomenology of what it's like to be a rat uh, <laughs> based based on these based on these EEG results. Um, the other thing I want to quickly point out here, and and maybe just get your take on is. Um, 
So I want to look at one of your results in conjunction with you know what happens to human beings when they take DMT. Um, so we notice here that we've got the drug period, the post-drug period, the recovery period. You see uh, changes in the EEG, in the theta band, in the low gamma band, going all the way out to this recovery period here. In other words, there are changes in patterns of brain activity after the main effects of the drug uh, should should have been worn off. And you know anyone who's done DMT, especially a number of times, will tell you that, yeah, the main experience sort of lasts for five to 10 minutes, then you stop hallucinating. But then if you sit there, you're not the same as you were before you took the DMT. You're in uh, you know, you're not hallucinating, you're not tripping, but you know, people often describe it as a sort of very meditative or, or Zen-like state that's nonetheless different from, from baseline conditions. And I think it's interesting that you're seeing those, those extended changes in the, the EEG signal here. I think so. Yeah. And, and those, uh, roughly correlate to the levels of DMT in the brain that we're measuring. So remember we saw that, uh, this dose dependent increase in DMT levels in the brain following administration, and that persists all the way until, uh, the end of the experiment. So, so there's still DMT in the brain and it's still, um, having, a you know, s- some sort of activity and that could be contributing to these EEG changes. So, so some of the EEG changes might be related to, uh, or correlated with, with the fact that we're seeing elevated levels of DMT in the, in the brain. Um, and those elevated levels, as you remember, they persisted into the post-drug and the recovery periods to the end of the experiment. Uh, therefore the DMT is still potentially active in the brain, causing these EEG changes to, to persist into the end of the experiment as well. Interesting. Um, okay, so you've detected DMT in the rat brain under baseline conditions. You've looked at the time course of DMT in the brain after you give it intravenously. You've shown that DMT um, changes the levels of various other transmitters in the brain, including serotonin and dopamine. And you looked at these global EEG changes, you know, global patterns of brain activity in response to uh, giving DMT to a rat. Um, if you had to sort of summarize it all, button it up, what would you say sort of the overall takeaway of that body of experiments is? I'd say the DMT re, um, needs further investigation as a potential neurosignaling molecule. Um, and it, it has effects on the um, canonical neurotransmitter system. That, that need to be investigated further. Um, it's, it's, you know, for the most part, it's a characterization study. So it's hard to, to make any uh, like causative um, conclusions here, but I think it does kind of lay the, lay the groundwork for some future studies to, to understand what's DMT doing in the brain and how does it work um, mechanistically? Mm-hmm. Would you say that, that your results, you know, either on their own or in conjunction with other studies, uh, provide conclusive evidence that there is endogenous DMT in the mammalian brain above levels that would suggest it's merely, you know, a, a, an inactive metabolite that's not doing much of anything. I think the results support that conclusion. Yeah. And so what are you guys working on now or what's the next logical step in investigating, you know, what what might be going on here in terms of what endogenous DMT is actually doing? Unfortunately, there's not there's not a lot of momentum there. Um, I, I mentioned that I'm I'm now in a postdoctoral role and I'm, I'm moved into the the clinical realm. So we're looking at um, the effects of psilocybin on patients with fibromyalgia, and um, unfortunately, no longer a part of that of that work. And I'm not sure if it's going to be picked up or not. So that's kind of been a been a struggle and a a challenge for me for over the last six years finishing the PhD and all that trying to find uh, funding and interest for people to kind of carry on this work. And it's just seems like the, especially in the last, last five years, the clinical realm has kind of taken over in terms of, of psychedelic interest um, for obvious reasons. But I think that there's just such a, such a need and it's uh, it would just really satisfy curiosity. And I think there's a lot of potential in investigating endogenous DMT, but you know, there's just uh, not a lot of momentum there right now. I see. So, so um, clinical work, work that's aimed at, you know, trying to figure out if we can develop therapies for human disease, that's soaking up all the funding. And there's not a lot of research going on for uh, just the more, the more basic biology here, because um, it's hard to get money for it. Yeah, that's, that's my interpretation. I mean, the, um, you know, the NIH is starting to put out um, notices for, for grants with, with regards to psychedelics, and they're not interested in, you know, 
the endogenous mechanisms of DMT. Um, they're interested in how can psilocybin or MDMA treat depression or, you know, trauma or things like that. Um, so I think that is soaking up a lot of the resources. And uh, I don't think uh, academic professionals are, are able to get, to get grants to, to fund this kind of work uh, very easily. So it's just, it's just not getting a lot of momentum. And so, so a lot of the clinical clinical work is being done. People are trying to, to use psychedelics to treat various conditions um, MDMA assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. You're looking at fibromyalgia. Um, others are looking at a whole set of other things. Um, so using psychedelics to treat human conditions or developing uh, psychedelic derivatives, potentially non hallucinogenic derivatives that that can serve that function. Um, and I think we all, all understand why this is important and why so many so many people are chasing this. One of the key experiments people do when they are trying to develop uh, psychedelic derivatives that are not hallucinogenic that we can then go do clinical trials in humans with is they'll give animals new drugs. They'll look for this thing called the head twitch response. Do animals have this um, high speed twitching over their head in the first few minutes of giving the drug? And that's that's the proxy behavior. So the way that people think about this um, is okay if we if we uh, you know give an animal say LSD, it's going to twitch its head a little bit in the first few minutes. And that's our proxy for hallucinations. We know that LSD is hallucinogenic in humans. If I now create a new drug derived from LSD that I hope retains some of its therapeutic potential, but is non-hallucinogenic, I will first give that to an animal, hopefully observe that it's not twitching its head. And that's what makes scientists think, ah, this might not be hallucinogenic. Therefore, let's see if we can go do human clinical trials with it. So with all that in mind, Nick, um, I want to look at your head twitch data from rats because there's a couple things here that I think were interested. Uh, interesting. Um, so let me do a screen share one more time. So you gave three different doses of DMT to rats, and you gave it to both male and female rats. Um, we can just look at the pooled data, I think. Um, and you you uh, you looked at the number of head twitches in a certain period of time. And you notice that a different amount of head twitching happened at different doses. So, can you can you summarize this data for us? What are we looking at here? Yeah, it's uh, I guess it was a little bit unexpected, but when you go back to the literature, you find this has actually been shown previously. And and what we saw that is uh, at, at the low dose, the zero point seven five milligrams per kilogram, we get the highest number of head twitches, um, and that's higher than the the medium dose and higher than the um, high dose. So this is sort of a sort of a biphasic response that's that's been shown with 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 other psychedelics as well, where uh, with increasing doses you get reduced behavioral response uh, in terms of the head twitch. Hmm. And you know, for something like DMT, we certainly would not expect uh, we would not expect that you know animals are hallucinating just at the low dose, but hallucinating less at the higher doses. Um, that would be very strange. Have you? You know, it's not shown here, but have you done the experiment or what would happen if you were to just inject an animal with saline here? Would there be any tw head twitching at all? No, we, we, we've done, we've done saline controls and there's, there's no head twitches. Okay. So, so it really is this, uh, uh, phenomenon where it goes up and then it actually goes back down as you escalate the dose. And you're saying that's been shown for, for, from other experiments as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With, with other tryptamine and phenethylamine psychedelics. Have yeah. you gone higher in dose um, or, you know, has anyone observed that, you know, if you, if you were to keep escalating the dose here, would the head twitching actually go down and potentially go away? I, I think that it would, because you can get into potentially seizures or, you know, um, unsafe conditions for, for the rats. Um, because I, I mentioned the behavioral effects previously, and I talked about that, that pancaking and that um, sort of backward walking and head weaving. And the higher the dose, the more intense those behavioral observations were. Mm. And it seems that at, at these really high doses, there's almost, um, it's, it's almost like a, it's almost like a sedative or it's almost like, um, like, like an anesthetic in a way where uh, the rats are, are, are very, you can tell they're very out of it and they're, and they're not, yeah. they're, they're like sort of no longer there. So it's almost like uh, these doses are like, if, if you were to translate these doses to humans, I'm not sure what that would be. It's really kind of difficult to make that, to make that translation, but um, this may be a, a DMT dose in humans that could just cause, you know, unconsciousness and, and amnesia, mm -hmm. you yeah. know? Yeah. 
So, so in theory, so so the the reason I found this interesting is, you know, I, I used to work in a rodent lab. Um, I know that people often they do different behavioral analyses. Very often, people aren't actually looking at the video of the animal. They're not uh, very very often. They're not actually in the room with the animal. They sort of just see the results at the end as they're quantified. So my question here is, you've got this whole. Um, body of work being done uh, in, in various labs where they're taking these new psychedelic derivatives. They're seeing if they're potentially not hallucinogenic by looking for the absence of a head twitch response in animals. They may or not be actually looking at the animals. I don't know because I'm not in the room with them, uh, but there's very prominent results showing a lack of head twitch response into a psychedelic derivative. And the conclusion is this is a you know candidate non-hallucinogenic compound with therapeutic potential. Um, do you think there's any worry there that uh, something else is going on? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think the the head twitch is is basically is is it's it's the best thing we have right now. Um, we we can't we can't know what's going on with the rats. We can't know what their experience is like, whether they're hallucinating, whether they're having an altered state of consciousness, or however you want to define it. Um, but there's really not a, not a better better measure at, at, at this point, and I, I can see that being a being a problem for the for the investigation of non hallucinogenic derivatives. Yeah. I mean, I, it'll be interesting to see if, you know, there, there's a lot of um, nice machine vision tools out there now that can do much more thorough, automated and quantitative behavioral profiling so that, you know, you, you can look at for multiple behavioral changes simultaneously over time and not just, you know, count individual head twitches. But the worry here would be that, you know, people are spending a lot of resources to do things like clinical trials based on the lack of some head twitching after giving a mouse a novel drug. And, it looks like it's at least feasible that the reason they might not see those head twitches is not because the drug is not hallucinogenic, but you know, because you're either it's either super hallucinogenic or you're giving the animal a seizure or serotonin syndrome or something. Right. And that's, that's why we, that's when we go back to the work of, uh, of Shulgin who, you know, who, who did it in his own way and decided to test all the compounds on himself <laughs> and, yeah. and his friends. Yeah. And you actually mentioned, you know, other researchers who used to do that, that used to be, um, you know, that used to be common basically, at least, um, in these special fields. Um, and obviously I think we all know why people don't do it today. Uh, you certainly couldn't report it because you'd get in trouble, but I mean, there's something to be said about having the courage to do that. Um, you know, uh, when you're working with these substances. Right. And I think, I mean, there's, there's a lot in, in PCAL and TCAL that, that could be looked at in terms of uh, new drug development. And there's, uh, that's, that's kind of a wealth of information for folks interested in, in developing some of these compounds potentially. Yeah. Interesting. So what got you, I mean, why were you personally motivated to study DMT to begin with? I think you got into this a little bit, but um, did did you just find this to be more fascinating in terms of what was known scientifically about this drug compared to other hallucinogens? Um, were you interested in the phenomenology of it? What was what was your motivation? Yeah, kind of all that. It was it was actually the work of, of Strassman. You know, I got in touch with uh, with the documentary and, and read the book, DMT, the spirit molecule. And that was in my younger days back when I was uh, uh, maybe, maybe early twenties or so, and kind of really interested in the phenomenology of this interesting compound that, you know, acts, you know, very, very quickly. And, and the effects are, are very short lived and I had this experience of like sort of dying and rebirth and like transcendence and all that. And it's really fascinated by, by Strassman's work. And, I kind of put that interest aside for a long time and went off and like lived my life for, you know, um, almost 10 years, <laughs> you know, had, had different jobs and traveled around and ended up going back to college in my, in my mid, mid twenties. And then after I, after I graduated from undergrad, um, I got a botany degree actually. And, uh, that's where I got into ethnobotany and started learning about Schultes and Wade Davis and ayahuasca and all that. Um, that was in about 2018, 2019. And I was, um, I was like, man, there's a psychedelic renaissance that's about to happen. You know, it was like just just emerging, just coming onto the field. Like Roland Griffiths and and their group were publishing some of those seminal studies on uh, anxiety and cancer patients. And uh, I was like, man, if I'm going to grad school, I gotta get back involved in this psychedelic stuff. This sounds really cool, and it's like the opportune time to do it. So I sent sent Strassman an email, and sure enough, he set me up with the lab at Michigan here and and uh, Gmo's lab where where John Dean was working in it just. Uh, been publishing that work with, with the rats. Um, and that's how I got connected with them. And, and then through that, I sort of just like rode the wave of, you know, the last five years of psychedelic, um, interest that's been kind of rolling across the country and the world. Uh, is there anything 
from what we talked about, anything from your work that you want to reiterate or summarize for people again before we sign off? You know, I think uh, if there's anyone out there who knows how to uh, bring some funding into endogenous DMT research, I, I have a you know group of people who could help support that, and um, I'd be happy to you know talk with anyone in, in that in that regard. Um, or if anyone out there is just curious about endogenous DMT and wants to get in touch with me, I'd be happy to just have a conversation about what we talked about here and other things. So, yeah. All right. Well, uh, if that's it, uh, thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, this was really interesting work to, to dive into and dissect and I look forward to seeing what you do next. Well, thanks Nick. Appreciate it. Hey everyone. I want to take a minute to tell you about a really cool health monitoring device I've been using for several weeks. It's called Lumen, and it's a handheld, pocket-sized device with a sleek design. It measures CO2 levels in your breath, which allows their technology to determine the extent to which your body is burning fats versus carbohydrates. Lumen helps improve your metabolic flexibility, your body's efficiency in shifting between using fats and carbs. It improves your ability to burn fat, which decreases your hunger levels and makes your body less dependent on snacking, and it can increase your energy levels by helping you develop a high-functioning metabolism. I use this device in the morning, before bed, and after meals and workouts to track my metabolism. With just a couple weeks of use, I learned a lot about which foods were causing my body to burn mostly fat, mostly carbs, or both, as well as how long I need to fast each day to promote fat burning. Lumen is great for anyone looking to optimize their health for either weight loss or athletic performance. The easy-to-use app allows you to track your results together with what you're eating and how you're exercising, and it syncs with other devices like the Apple Watch. Click the link in the episode description to learn more and use the code MIND, M-I-N-D, in all capital letters, to get $50 off your Lumen device today.